Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. So good to see you all. Hope you're doing well. Let's stand and worship together. I know. 
welcome to church today. I hope you had a great week this past week. Here at the church, we had Vacation Bible School, and it went really well. Many of you helped with that, and we appreciate that uh, very much. And uh, it's summertime. It's hot. I get that. Uh, but it's almost August, so then you can see the end. And so and Nancy even went out the other day, and she talked to the dogs and said, uh, hang in there. It's going to get better. And uh, so I said, well, we can just let them in the house if you want. It's not, nope, that didn't happen. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, one of the ways that I have of getting to know who you are is if you'll fill one of these out. It's in, the, uh, in front of you there. And if you'll put that in one of the boxes at the exits, then that gives me an opportunity to get to know who you are. And uh, if you have a prayer request or something you want to make known to me, you can uh, let that be known also on this. Uh, take a minute and let those near you know you're glad to see them in church this morning. Thanks for being here.
the earth began to shake and the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made as the heavens rose?
thank you so much that by the shed blood of Jesus, we are able to receive grace. We are able to receive full coverage of our past, present, and future sin, God, and we thank you so much for that. Please help us to walk in the reality of eternity, God, to walk in the empowerment that your Holy Spirit provides us, that we would be a church that loves and serves well, that welcomes well, and that people would look at us and see a unified body of Christ. Father, we praise your name. I lift up Brother Earl as he comes to bring your truth, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Earlier this year, I had my first root canal ever, and a specialist in Oklahoma City named Dr. Duke uh, did the procedure. I thought that was cool to have a, a dentist and a dog that are both named the same thing. Uh, she did a great job. Uh, she was high energy, and she's doing the procedure, and they have you in a position where you can't really contribute to the conversation, but she kept talking to her assistant and asking for things, and she said thank you a hundred times. She'd just say thank you, thank you, and she'd keep me updated. Now, this is what we're doing. She'd show up, this is what we're doing. I know I was really happy when she said, we're around and third on this thing and headed home, and I thought, all right, it's about over, and it was. And I'm here to tell you this morning that when it comes to the book of Acts, we're rounding third, and we're headed home. I look back, and we've been in, in the book of Acts off and on since January of 2020. So that's almost four years. Now, obviously, I haven't preached from the book of Acts every time. I've tried to provide a variety in what we do, but this is uh, we're down to the last two chapters, Acts 27 and 28, and I've got six uh, sermons from those two chapters. And when we're finished, there will have been a total of 69 sermons from the book of Acts, uh, I told Robert and Sue Mingus that the other day, and Sue said, uh, have you learned anything? <laughs> I said, well, I'm always learning. Uh, and so I've really enjoyed this study of the life of the early church. These next two chapters, in verse, chapters 27 and 28, are full of action, and uh, it'll be, they're going to be good. So let me set the stage before I read the first 12 verses in Acts chapter 27. The Apostle Paul has been taken captive in Jerusalem, then he was transferred to Caesarea. He was falsely accused of taking some Gentiles into the temple, and the religious leaders are trying to use the Roman government to do their bidding and to get him killed. The main thing they hate about him is that he says that anybody can be saved, whether they're a Gentile or not. They don't have to have a Jewish background. They'd have to know all the Old Testament. They can just trust in Jesus. And so that's the main thing that they have against him. But they're leveraging everything they can legally to try to get rid of him. He's been in jail now, or incarcerated, for over two years in Caesarea, and now he has appealed to Rome, since it's his right as a Roman citizen. He's in the process of beginning that journey to go uh, to Rome, uh, where he'll stand before Caesar as far as he hearing his case. The journey should take about five weeks from the uh, end of the Mediterranean Sea all the way over to Rome. It's going to end up and take seven or eight months because of all the stuff that happens along the way. And so that's where we are. Paul has been falsely accused, incarcerated. Uh, now he's being transported to Rome. And uh, that's where we pick up the story in chapter 27. I would say he's been a Christian now and serving for probably close to 25 years. So you read it through the book of Acts and it just seems like he's probably just maybe 32. No, he's, he's been at this for a while. And uh, so he's older and he is going to Rome, even though this is not how he thought his life was going to turn out. This is how it did turn out. I know none of you could identify with that, that your life never has taken a turn that you didn't see coming. Uh, but uh, his did. And so this is where we pick up the story in verse 1 of chapter 27 in Acts. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan, Augustan cohort named Julius, and embarking in a ship of... Adra Midium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. The word lee, it just means they use the cover of the island to protect them from the wind. And when he had sailed across the open sea, we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. This was one of the bread baskets of the Roman Empire, and so they 
transport grain, and they're going to take that to Italy, and he's going to take these people, they're going to hitch a ride on it. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus, and as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon, Salmon. Coasting along with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lasau. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, the harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Uh, Paul's trip to Rome got off to a rough start. You're going to find out that in your life, as you follow God's plan for your life, it's not always going to be smooth sailing. Now, as we look at this passage, I'm, I'm always impressed with the Apostle Paul that he just keeps on keeping on, that he does not, he's not deterred by whatever happens around him. And I'm going to use him as the example, and I'm going to tell you three actions that you're going to have to take if you're going to be a lifer as far as being used by God in the building of his kingdom. If you're going to reign loyal to Jesus for the rest of your life, you may change what you do and where you go and where you are, but if you want to remain in there for the rest of your life, I'm going to give you three actions that you're going to have to take. Action number one, do what you can. Do what you can. We live in a world that has so many great needs all around us and no generation has ever had more access to know all the major problems in the world than we do. We, can, we know instantaneously when anything happens. We know all of the big things that are going on in life and when we have access to all of that. And the danger is that if you are so overwhelmed with all of the human trafficking and all of the drug needs and all of the abuses that happen in the world and all the different things that are taking place that you become almost vapor locked yourself and just sit down and don't do anything because you don't have access to change big deals so I just won't do anything because it's just overwhelming no you can't do that Paul's the example do what you can first of all that one thing you can do is build and enjoy relationships I've been telling you for the last four weeks, I, and I tell you all the time, life is about relationships. And so even though Paul is falsely accused of being a spreader of false religion, that he had taken Gentiles into the temple, all these things, he continued to build relationships with people, and it was those relationships were a source of fulfillment and joy for Paul. And they were also the way that God used him to make disciples, to spread the gospel. It was through the, the relationships. In this passage, it starts out and it says, we. So, so we, that means Luke, the author of the book of Acts, is back with Paul at this time. Uh, he hadn't heard from him since about chapter 23. Uh, evidently, he had been near enough to Caesarea to help Paul. He's a, a physician, and Paul had some physical needs. But anyway, he, he gets back with him at this time. He knows Luke. And so he's with him. Then he mentions this guy from Thessalonica, uh, Ma or Macedonian from Thessalonica, named Aristarchus. He was a, he's called a fellow worker with Paul in other places where Paul wrote. And evidently, even though he's not guilty of anything where he has to go to Rome, he chooses to go with Paul because he wants to support him and help him. Then when they, get, uh, they go for one day and they come to a place... Uh, to, uh, and he says that Julius treated Paul kindly and, get, and had him leave to go to his friends and, he, and be, be cared for. Everywhere Paul goes, he's got these relationships. He's got these friends. So he goes to them, and uh, this was not going to be a cruise ship with all meals provided and everything you need provided. Uh, he's riding on this ship, and he needs supplies, and he goes to friends, and they supply those needs for him. So everywhere Paul went, he has these relationships that he's made, that he's invested in, and that's the way that the gospel spreads, that's the way that disciples are made, that's the way that fulfillment in life is found, is through relationships. So he's wrongly treated by the Roman government, he's incarcerated, he has all this other stuff going on, but he still is able to build and enjoy relationships. You're the same way. Whatever's going on in your life, whether you've been laid off or whether you've got issues going on with various situations in life, all kinds of problems, you still have access to build relationships with other people and you're able to enjoy those relationships and it's through those relationships that you make an impact uh, for Jesus Christ. 
Uh, I loved watching Vacation Bible School this year. All of the adults, youth, uh, everybody working together. And uh, it was great to see the impact they had on children, but also the relationships they build with one another. Uh, we have scheduled here at the church, it's called FBC at the Table, where three times, uh, August, September, October, you have access to, to share a meal with somebody else in the church. We're going to put three families together, and then you'll, you'll host once, and then also you'll go somewhere else twice. And, it's, and we will intentionally not put you with your best friends, unless you're best friends with everybody. We want to get to know different people, and that's the whole point of that, is to get out of my comfort zone, get to know other people, spend some time with them. And when you do that, uh, God uses that to enrich your life. I hate to think where I'd be today if I'd been bashful in the sense of not ever talking to new people. I never would have met Bryce Murphy. I never would have met Trevor Ridgeway. I never would have met Daryl Penner. Daryl's kind of intimidating with that big mustache, and he's just a big old guy. He's just, I mean, there's this, all over, there's people that you, when you make relationships, that what's, that's what enriches life. And that's where you're able to, so well, do what you can. Build and enjoy relationships. Secondly, speak up. Don't just back off and not say a thing. When you have something to say, go ahead and say it. Paul, when they get to the island of Cyprus, and they're at a place called Fair Havens, and he's, he knows some stuff about sh uh, shipwrecks. In, Acts, in uh, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 11, he mentions that he had been shipwrecked three times, and that would predate what's going on right here. So he's been through three shipwrecks himself, and it was common knowledge that between in September and October, Sailing was very difficult on the Mediterranean Sea. No one even sailed between November and February. And so he knows that, and he speaks up. And he says, it's already in the Day of Atonement, which it refers to as a fast, that was in the very beginning of October. So it's late enough in the season, he, said, he speaks up whenever the Julius is going to go ahead and go. And he says, no, it's not wise to do this. And so he, sh he speaks up. They don't listen to him, but he still speaks up. Satan is able to delude, to delude and deceive more so whenever we don't speak up and share truth. Now, obviously, we share the gospel, but also we have insight into other things as well. And the only way, you know, as we... we I'll use a word here. That don't throw anything at me. I'm just, I hear this all the time about conspiracy. People have talked about that since the COVID. And I don't know if people are smart enough to deceive whoever. I don't know. But I do know Satan is. You know, someone told me the other day, he said he's smart enough to convince the third of the angels to leave heaven and go to the earth with him. Uh, so he's, he's smart. But he operates in the darkness in the sense that if we just don't speak the truth, then lies are believed. And so I'm not saying everybody's going to believe what you're going to say because Paul, he speaks up, but nobody does what he says, but he still he spoke up. And he didn't speak up initially. He wasn't a blabbermouth. He didn't try to dominate the situation. It's just like when there was a pause in a the conversation, they're saying, I think we'll go ahead and go on uh, over to uh, the rest of the island and go 40 miles over to Providence. He's like, nope not wise and so you need to speak up and that applies to your relationships with other people they may not heed what you have to say they may not follow your advice but you can give godly counsel you can give a christian worldview you can get i mean not a whole sermon but you just speak up speak truth and then don't don't be convinced that you have nothing to offer do what you can Build and enjoy relationships because that's how God's going to use you to impact the world. Speak up. Say what you know, just like Paul did. And then thirdly, pray. Paul obviously is practicing what he always wrote about, and that is to pray without ceasing. And even though he had chains on his wrists and he is unable to do much of anything, he's a prisoner, uh, he is able to pray. Uh, we read in the books that he writes that he's praying constantly for those that have become believers and for the churches, and he, he does that. And one of the things that we can do is that we can, even though we can't control the world situation, we can't control all these things, we can pray. And Jesus 
told us that we have not because we ask not. And sometimes I think that we become so overwhelmed with how, much th how many things are going on around us that we end up and we even quit asking God to do what only God can do. And so one of the things we can do is pray. Uh, I tell, you know, we have people in our church who can't come to church. Uh, they really can't because of physical limitations. And when I visit with them in their homes, I thank them for their prayers because they continue to pray on behalf of the church and the building of the kingdom and the growth of the kingdom. And you don't have to be homebound to pray. We can all pray at all times. So, so the world is, uh, I don't know how many times I've heard that the last several years. The world's just headed to, you know, where in a handbasket. It's just, oh, it's nothing. and it's almost like everybody's just going to say, forget it. We're just, let's just go down the tubes. Let's just go down the drain. It's just, Man, I should have had, had Daryl fix a little deal where it just dropped down. That would have been cool. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I won't lie. I, I feel the same way sometimes too. I mean, things happen. It's like, what? You're kidding me. What can I do? How can I make a difference? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep building relationships uh, to enjoy and so the gospel spreads. I'm, I'm going to speak up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back. I'm not...
they could control the stormy weather. I, I'm old enough to remember when people were seeding the clouds or whatever, trying to make it rain when it was really dry, uh, and uh, man thinking that he can control nature. Uh, God actually is the one who created the world and everything in it, and he controls it, and he's still charged today. And uh, whatever happens uh, is as he allows. Three weeks ago, when all the wind came through here and blew a lot of trees over and uh, caused a lot of damage, uh, the people who had their trees fall over were not more evil than the people whose trees did not fall over. Those of you whose power went out were not worse Christians for it because God, I mean... It, it rains on the just and the unjust, and the storms come on the just and the unjust. And here you have the Apostle Paul in the midst of a storm. They've been going along the south side of what's modern-day Turkey, uh, going from place to place, and it was stormy there. Then they go over to Cyprus, and it's stormy there. And not one time do we have Paul saying, let's pause and have a prayer meeting to stop the storms. He didn't do that. That's just what happens in the fallen world. You have stormy weather. Uh, those of you who are farmers, you know that more than anybody. Uh, that's why you're such great people of faith usually, I don't know how anybody farms without being a Christian, you have to have great faith but you get your crop hailed out and somebody else doesn't get their crop hailed out, that doesn't mean uh, anything as far as spiritually how what's going on uh, I accept what I cannot control and one of those is stormy weather that that happens sometimes and I'm not God I'm not in charge of that but God is, so Things happen in life that are disappointing. Uh, there's evil behavior. Uh, there's, there are foolish choices that are made. Uh, there's stormy weather. There's all these things going on. And I have to accept that even though I can't control that, I believe that God is in control. And I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not going to make that the priority. So what can I do? How am I going to remain faithful like Paul? over the long term, even when life doesn't seem to be fair. Well, first of all, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going, to, I'm going to keep praying and speaking up and building and enjoying relationships. I'm going to accept the things I can't control. I wish I could control them. I, I, actually, I wish some of you could control them uh, so that we wouldn't have evil behavior and foolish choices and stormy weather, but I can't fix that. But then the, the third thing that I can do and that I will do like Paul did, is that I'm going to keep following Jesus. Keep following Jesus. You can do that, no matter what happens. Um, I read the other day, a guy named William James said, that which holds our attention determines our action. Whatever we're looking to is going to determine what we do in life. And uh, keep following Jesus. Stay focused on him. Uh, when uh, used to, when, when I helped my dad plow, you know, periodically you plow crossways, or like at an angle, kind of like some of you mow your grass, where you, you know, you mix it up so it won't have the rut. And when it was, when I was plowing a field and I had to go diagonal, I would pick a fence post, I'd pick a tree, I'd pick something, that, and I would just, this is before GPS, by the way. So, I mean, y'all don't ever make any mistakes anymore. Good. I mean, this is, this is old school. But you just keep looking and plowing towards that one object, and you can stay fairly straight. I didn't pick a cow that's moving around. You know, that's, that's not very wise. You, you want to keep something stable. And uh, in our lives, uh, the focus has to be on Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. Life keeps changing. There's evil. There's all kinds. Of, I'm going to just keep following Jesus. And as you follow him and the world changes around you, you just stay focused on him. Uh, keep following Jesus uh, from the inside out. That is, you have to have a changed heart to be able to follow Jesus consistently. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he, he said, well, who, who are you, Lord? And he surrenders to him. He begins to follow Christ. He became a new creation. God changed him from the inside out, and God still does that. That God 
moves into our lives and then he cleans us up and he empowers us to stay faithful to him and from the inside out we keep following Jesus. Well, following Jesus is not when you come to the front and let me give you a list of 15 do's and 15 don'ts and then try to do it in your own strength. That's not how it works. You really are changed from the inside out uh, by the power of God when the Holy Spirit comes to live within you at the time when you say yes to Jesus. And so keep following Jesus uh, from the inside out. And I, before I move on, I've just asked you, have you been uh, changed from the inside out by the power of Jesus Christ? Have you been saved? Is there a transformation of you from the inside out because of your relationship with God? Um, that's how we follow Jesus is we have to have a relationship with him through faith and to be changed continually from the inside out. Building his kingdom. Keep following Jesus from the inside out, building his kingdom. Uh, Paul's passion was to see the kingdom of God grow. More and more people become followers of Jesus Christ. He had spent almost 25 years in uh, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and in Eastern Europe, and churches have been established. He's been working there, and now he has written earlier to the church in Rome. He says, I want to come to Rome, and then from there I'll go on to Spain. You'll help me, and I want to see the kingdom grow on into Western uh, Europe. And so his passion was to build the kingdom, and that should be our passion as well, not just the staff, but all of us who are followers of Jesus, yeah, you want to do well in your occupation, you want to make a good wheat crop, you want to be able to do all those things. But in the midst of all that, the primary thing is I want to build the kingdom of God. I'm going to abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build the church, go make disciples. That's what we do. And so that's what it means to follow Jesus. And so we as a church, we may have to continually learn what it means like to live for Jesus in a culture that is increasingly anti-Jesus. There are more and more people that think they don't want to have anything to do with God. They don't want to have anything to do with church. They don't, I mean, that's, but we have to follow Jesus anyway. Uh, we may be able, to be able to learn something from our uh, Slovakian brothers and sisters when they visit with us about what it means to live in a culture that's anti-Jesus. And just because the culture changes and the leadership of the culture, that doesn't mean that anything changes as far as we keep following Jesus uh, building his kingdom and trusting his word trusting his word when this entire fiasco started back in Acts chapter 23 and Paul was taken captive the Lord appears to him in Acts 23 verse 11 and says to him take courage for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem so you must testify also in Rome so that's a promise. And Paul knows if I get killed in a shipwreck out here in the Mediterranean Sea, then Jesus is a liar. So he knows he's going to make it to Rome because Jesus has promised him that that's going to happen a couple of years ago. He's promised and he's still standing on the promise that Jesus had given to him. The way we follow Jesus is we continue to trust what his word teaches us. That we trust his word given to us in the form of the Bible and that we hold to it, that we know there's a way of salvation, we know that there's an end to evil, we know that there is a, a really is a heaven, there really is a hell, that there really is the presence of God with us. How do I know all that? I know that because that's what the Bible teaches me. And how do I know what the Bible teaches me? I come to church, I study the Bible, I read it for myself, I abide in Christ, and as I, I'm trusting what the Word of God tells me, even when it may seem chaotic, around me. So, when life is not smooth sailing, what do I do? I just throw up my hands and just criticize everything I can, just say, ah, forget it all. Everybody's, they're all heading there in a handbasket, and there's nothing I can do, and I'm just sick of messing with them. No, here's what you do. You do what you can. You keep building relationships, enjoying those, sharing the gospel through those. You keep praying. You keep speaking up. Uh, you accept that you can't eliminate all evil behavior and foolish choices and stormy weather. I can't take care of all that, but I can keep following Jesus in the life that I have from now on.
I never did get to be a fan of plowing. I started at a young age, probably not as young as I say now. You know, the, the further I get removed from being a kid, the greater athlete I was and the harder I had it at home. You know, it's just terrible. So I don't remember how old I was, probably three. No, I'm just kidding. I was young, I, and uh, I started plowing on a Alice Chalmers tractor with a low-clearance Haney plow. Why in the world anybody in the history of the world would ever make a low-clearance Haney plow, I have no idea. And if you don't know what one is, just trust me, it was a stupid choice. And this plow did not have a hydraulic lift. It had a hand lift, like, like how you adjust the wheels on your lawnmower. That's how you adjusted the depth of this plow that was behind my Alice Chalmers plow tractor. And so, if we had fairly good wheat, and I, evidently we did some years, lots of straw with that old kind of triumph wheat that made all kinds of straw, and uh, I'd be plowing, and then this straw would ball up underneath the low clearance hamey and I had to go back to throw it throw the clutch in go back pull the levers down to raise the plow and then drive out into the unplowed area until that ball of straw dumped out and then go back over reset the plow for how deep it needs to go and then keep going again till it balled up again and then go undo it go drive around till it all un un you couldn't pay me to do that. I think the going rate when I started was 50 cents an hour. Which if you go from daylight till dark, you can make enough to buy a cup of coffee now. Um, so I didn't do it for the money. You know why I did it? I did it for my daddy. He was the terrace over in a 930 case and we're trying to get it all done so it can rain and then we can do it again. I wish there would have been no-till back then. That would have been awesome. My daddy was proud of me, and my daddy loved me, and my daddy was allowing me to be a co-laborer with him in the field. And that's what I liked. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus is going to take you to be with him one day in heaven. And he allows you now to be a co-laborer with him in building the kingdom. And that's why, even when it gets hard, even when the storms rage, even when things are said, things are done, whatever happens in the world that you can't control, you just keep following Jesus because you're not doing it for the praise of man. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the one who died for you. Let's stand for prayer. Father, I thank you for the example of an older, seasoned, faithful follower of Jesus who just kept on keeping on. Empower us to do the same. I know that Many people in this congregation today have heartache and hurt and disappointment just because that's, that's what happens in this world sometimes. I pray you would give them the freedom not to blame themselves and that they would let go and trust you completely with the situation and follow after you with joy and peace and courage that only you can give. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be here at the front in our final song. If I can help you in any way, uh, you come and visit with me. If you don't want to visit now, I'll be hanging out in the hallway sometime in between service. Come up and I'd be glad to visit with you. the team.
Good morning. Like you just saw in the video, we have Crowder Baptism coming up in a few weeks. If you'd like to make the public proclamation of your faith or you have questions about baptism, please contact the staff. We would love to have a conversation with you and get you signed up for baptism. And as you can see, we just finished up a week of VBS and like Michael predicted, it was incredible. Between volunteers and kids, we had 436 people learning and sharing the gospel this week. We are so thankful for you, church. And next, if you're looking for a way to get to know other church members, signups for At The Table will be available for a few more weeks. When you sign up, you are committing to participate in a meal for three Sundays, one in August, September, and October. The staff will put people into small groups. Then, on those specific Sundays, your group will define how and when you would like to share a meal. Our hope is that this encourages you to practice hospitality and that you branch outside your comfort zone to meet new people. Families and individuals are all welcome to sign up. And finally, as we start August this week, I know, crazy, be on the lookout for Wednesday night activities. There are so many ways to participate and serve on Wednesday nights. We would love for you to join us. And as you go today, remember, abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build the church, and go and make disciples. You're dismissed.